You are listening to the Visualizing War podcast. In each episode, we talk about representations of war in art, text, film, and music. With new guests each time, we look at how people have described or imagined war in different periods and places, and we discuss the impact which war stories have on us as individuals and societies. Hello, my name is Alice Koenig, and I co-direct the Visualizing War project at the University of St. Andrews. Over the past few episodes, we've been looking at different ways of narrating and visualizing the two world wars. And this episode will bring that short mini series to a close by picking up on one of the themes that our guests from the Imperial War Museum talked about last week, the importance of visualizing historic wars, not just from the perspective of hindsight, but through the day-to-day -day experiences of people as they lived the conflicts in real time. My guest today is Professor Julian Wright, a historian of modern Europe and head of the Department of Humanities at Northumbria University. Julian specializes in French intellectual, political and cultural history, but more broadly, he's fascinated by the idea and experience of time. With colleagues from other disciplines, he's leading a project called Time on a Human Scale, which prompts historians who are reconstructing the past to look more closely at how humans experience the present in those times. One aspect of this work is a new project which Julian has recently got underway, looking at the experiences of ordinary people who were living outside of time in the era of the Second World War. He's interested in how the war disrupted everyday practices, and with that, people's perceptions of time. And also in how people tried to cope with this, establishing new rhythms and seeing, feeling, measuring and trying to control time differently, whether they were living under siege, in prison camps, or living in secrecy in occupied Europe. Our perception of time has a huge impact on how we visualize everything. So Julian's research is really interesting to the Visualizing War project, and I'm very excited to have the chance to dive into it today. Julian, we've got lots to talk about, from how people's experiences of time can be disrupted by war, to how that affects the ways in which people then visualize wartime itself, and the stories they tell to make more sense of what they're going through. But first, I want to welcome you to the Visualizing War podcast. Thank you very much for taking time to talk to me today. Thank you for having me, Alice. So I wonder if we can kick off first by talking about your wider project, Time on a Human Scale. Can you just give us a quick outline of that project and explain why it's important that we put the human present back into our histories of the past? Yes, thank you. So this project actually has just seen the light of day because a new volume of essays with that title, Time on a Human Scale, Experiencing the Present in Europe, 1860 to 1930, was published last Thursday in the series curated by the British Academy, Proceedings of the British Academy. And it was an opportunity to do some work with literary scholars and a musicologist and cultural historians and historians of theology, historians of war, um, on the idea that modern Europeans, and we focus particularly on the early 20th, late 19th century, were trying to think about what the present meant to them, and that they were doing this at this really key point early in the 20th century and then through the First World War at a point where hopes for the future and the great enlightenment myth of progress and the great aspirations for being able to change the world that were launched by the French Revolution 100 years earlier. And all of those hopes seemed to be thrown up in the air. And coming at, at those questions, as I did as a French historian by training, my own interest in the theme came from the idea that in France, I found people who were really trying to move away from the myth of the future and the myth of progress, but without losing their focus on democracy, social justice, or social change and redemption. So I had a particular interest in this theme, it goes back to my earlier work on socialism in France, in looking at people who aspired to change society, but who wanted to change society in the present, incrementally in the small things that happen around us every day. So that was my starting point, and, and I was able to work with an exceptional cultural historian called Allegra Frixel, who's just started a second postdoc in Zurich, and Allegra's doctoral thesis was on the present as it was explored and experienced in philosophy and music and drama and um, dance across the same period. So Allegra and I worked together and pulled together a, a really exciting team of scholars from different disciplines, basically interrogating the meanings of the present as Western Europeans grappled with this during this amazingly important period. The, the final section in the book focused a bit more on the First World War, and we have two wonderful chapters in there, one on the present as it's lived through in the trenches 
and one on the present in a diary of a young French woman living through 1913, the diary runs from 1913 through to 1917. So we had those two contrasting windows on the present, one at the front and then one at, one at home, male and female, to close the volume. So already you're pulling out some really fascinating things there, touching on the First World War, but looking back much earlier than that, and really getting us to think actually already about the way in which our visualisations of time have a huge impact on how we operate, how we order and plan our lives and actually make progress rather than simply charting progress. So that's really fascinating. So just to pull this then into time and visualisations of war, last week we talked to curators at the Imperial War Museum in London about their newly opened World War II galleries. And they were very clear from early on in their design phase that they wanted to tell a chronological story of World War II that reflected the contemporary experience of it as it unfolded, rather than having explanations of events in 1940, say, overshadowed by events in 1945 or, or 1944. So I suppose my question to you is, how unusual is that approach? How easy or difficult is it as well to suspend our knowledge of the future or the past, how things ended up playing out, and really look at time in the present and transport ourselves back to a period during a war, let's say, when no one knew how long that war would last or what its outcome might be. That's a really interesting that the curators at the IWM are working in that way. And I think the, that approach actually connects to some really exciting work that's being driven in particular, I find, by British uh, literary scholars. And I'm thinking in particular of a scholar working at Sheffield called Beryl Pong, whose 2020 book on wartime in literature and culture, I'm just, just getting into now, uh, slightly belatedly, but it came out last year. Um, but, but Beryl Pong is developing an argument that literary scholars have been putting out uh, in their analysis of the British literary scene in the 1940s, which is really bringing to the front of our mind the sense of people living in this period not knowing when the great high points of conflict or the great denouements or the great apotheoses of, of this extraordinary conflict are going to happen. So what are they living through? Well, they're not living through the denouement. They're not living through the apotheosis. They're waiting for it or they're anticipating it in often in, 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 in a state of suspense or fear or anxiety. And that sense of fear and anxiety, I think, is something that you, you draw out of the literature of this period, and then I'm going to be looking at this in many other sources as well, as something that is ongoing and continuous. And people make the point that the continuity of this state of anxiety, it goes back into the 1930s, long before the formal outbreak of hostilities in, in Western Europe. And it goes on into the late 1940s after the end of the war, particularly you move away from the British context and you think about the extraordinary things that are still going on as, as, as um, conflict and violence and destruction continues into 1946, 47, 48 in Eastern Europe, as Eastern Europe and Central Europe realign themselves bit by bit and start to get through some of the trauma. So this sort of sense of living in wartime, which literary scholars are drawing out, I think that historians more generally can work with. And it is a sense that you've got to get away from our received structures for organising the period and look at things with quite different te temporal rhythms. And, and that, I think, is really interesting. And how, how you do that in a museum or how you do that as a historian is very challenging, but also very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the World War II galleries are looking way beyond the end of World War II, precisely for that reason, because, of the, you know, we draw a line, we put a period, we identify 1945 as roughly the stopping point. But, you know, it's important actually to narrate beyond that and to narrate that sort of uncertainty and that, that, that ongoing anxiety, that ongoing experience of, of dislocation and trauma and so on. So you're bringing out there one really interesting feature for the Visualising War project, which is that our experience of time is a lot to do with storytelling. It's a lot to do with the structures that we impose, sometimes retrospectively, but it, it's really fascinating to hear you talking about the way in which texts at the time, perhaps, or you know, people's narratives at the time can get us to see people living through periods that might end up being described as high points or denouements, but which aren't recognised as such at that moment and which are only retrospectively characterised like that. But that fear and anxiety that comes from anticipating high points or low points or so on. So all of that's quite destabilizing and, and, and your, your current project revolves around the idea that war brings this sense of temporal dislocation. 
Um, so I wonder if you can just explain a bit more what you mean by that and maybe give us a couple of examples of how World War II really disrupted people's experiences or sense of time, both for people who were fighting and for people who weren't. Well, I perhaps take you back to where my thought processes around this theme really started. And I suppose it was 10 years ago, uh, not long after my grandfather died. My grandfather was a British officer, prisoner of war, captured in uh, 1940 in Normandy after the Dunkirk em embarkation. He was part of the 51st Highland Division who were rounded up further along the coast of Normandy at saint valery and from June 1940 to April 1945 then was in captivity in Germany, briefly in Poland. And not long after he died, I was asked to review extraordinary memoir by the French resistance operative Daniel Cordier. And Cordier was the same age as my grandfather. Cordier, by the way, just died last year at a ripe old age. An extraordinary figure, really, who put many, many aspects of the French resistance firmly on the map when he came back to them in his writings in the 1980s and 90s, having not really written or thought about them much at all in the 50s and 60s. So Cordier, I was engaging with Cordier, who was a resistance operative, and also thinking about my grandfather. So I had two things that jumped out. One was picking out um, correspondence from my grandfather to my great-grandparents and a 1944 Christmas card that the British prisoners of war had been able to print and run off in Eichstätt, uh, the officer camp where my grandfather was. And it's a super image of a British officer um, smoking, knitting, very cold winter, so there's lots of knitting going on. Knitting is very, very important in temporality studies. And the, there are two kittens on the floor playing with a ball of wool, uh, which the officer is using to make his jumper. And the ball of wool is unravelling, and as it unravels, it spells out the words this year, next year, sometime. And uh, that sort of stayed with me as, 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 a, as a sort of visual motif for what, what, what we were thinking about. What are the times that we are in when these guys are sitting inactive because the officers were not allowed to work under the Geneva Convention? So how did they, how did they wait? How did they endure? And you know, what is endurance in those particularly demanding contexts? So I had that on the one hand, and then Cordier left France in June 1940, as the uh, German tanks moved south um, and went on a boat and went to join de Gaulle in London, along with various other young, um, heroically minded French souls. And um, as the boat leaves Biarritz Harbour and he sees his father waving goodbye to him, he writes in the journal, uh, you know, has a strange sense of living outside of time. The past has been cut off for me forever and I have no concept of what the future might hold. And what was really interesting to me reading Cordier's memoir was how slow everything felt. It took ages for him to be involved in action. And in fact, the kind of action that he did get involved with was very different to the kind of action that um, he'd hoped to be involved with. He never fired a shot in anger at a German. And that was the sort of thing he thought he'd been doing. So it's a very long memoir, um, Alias Kahakala, is the title that was one of his um, resistance aliases and it's the reconstructed journal which narrates the story of the resistance as a slow story often very boring and very draining and so my thesis then i suppose is that you can look at people living away from the front in wartime and what's going on is that they are having to renegotiate their story in time they lost the past and the future and the rhythm of life, the rhythm through which you get from today through to tomorrow, feels hopelessly muddled and confused and often strange. And so those two different examples, somebody living in secrecy, because, because as a resistance person, it's the secrecy that sort of locks you up in a little bubble where you have no relationships with normal relationships with people around you that you would normally have, or the prisoners of war for whom correspondence is always late and, and they have no understanding of exactly how their condition is going to get better. Those two things were the sort of twin tracks that, that got me started thinking about this as a period in which we've got these amazing sources from lots of ordinary people, far more than the First World War, and, and one could expand this to many other kinds of case studies as well, this idea of temporal dislocation and how people negotiate their way through it. So in both of those case studies that you just talked about, there's a really intense experience of the present and this sense of being cut off from past and future and unable actually to sort of navigate between 
those sort of inherited ideas and that, that kind of comfort that we have in peacetime, I suppose, of the sense that we're on a journey and we're making progress. I'm really struck by what you said about Cordier there, um, about the fact that he, you know, he imagined a very different life of service. He imagined a very different war for himself. And this is something that quite a few of our other podcast guests have come, have talked about. The fact that war itself can be incredibly boring, that can be very monotonous, whether you're fighting on the front or whether you're somewhere at home. Actually, our habits of visualizing war are really out of sync with the, the monotonous, slow reality. Could you say a bit more about knitting and temporality studies? I'm not sure I can, no, but um, but I do have a jumper knitted by my grandfather from old socks, unstitched, and then, you know, knitted back together again. He actually exhibited it at a local, you know, church fair or something uh, when he was back in his hometown in Morpeth in Northumberland a few years after the end of the war. So we have it. I can't wear it because I'm much fatter than he was. <laughs> but it was very important because that last winter was extremely gruelling and extremely cold. Um, so we've already begun talking about this a little bit, but this idea that disruption in the present doesn't just disrupt our experience of the present, but really messes with our perceptions of the past and the future. Um, I think that some of your work that you have planned is going to be looking at how, for example, experiences of trauma in the present can really reduce people's ability to reminisce about the past and reduce people's focus, you know, just to the present, to reduce their ability actually to look forward. Is that right? Yes, and I could perhaps give you sort of an extreme example of that, but then actually test it with a much less extreme example as well. So one of the things that we hope to do in the project is to be able to work with somebody who will, we hope, go and dig into the amazing archives from the Leningrad siege, where um, Leningrad citizens were strongly encouraged to, to, to engage in life writing and to keep diaries. And so the Leningrad diaries are really one of the most remarkable sources for modern history. But there, there are other examples from Eastern Europe as well. And the theme for this particular part of the project is hunger, living in hunger. So it may also be that whoever comes to work with us might be able to work on um, on the ghettos in Poland or in or in Minsk, um, where starvation is again very much on the cards, as it was in the siege of Leningrad. And just in my own brief readings early on planning this, I'm very struck by in that acute trauma of acute hunger and famine, actually the mind, you know, starts to bend itself into time in quite an astonishing way. And people's focus on their physiological presence, waking up in the morning and getting through the morning either you know queuing for bread or if they're at home what they're doing to keep warm the way that day is narrated in a diary starts to become intensely focused in, in a way that's really almost shocking so the literary scholars and linguistic scholars who understand how to unpick the syntax of text in ways that are you know more clever than my own training will be able to tell you that if you look at the syntax of somebody writing a diary in acute hunger it's not the same as the way they're writing when times are more normal. I'm thinking particularly of the work of Anne Friedman, who's written a, an exceptional study of diaries from Jewish French captives in the French context in the 1940s. And she's gone in and observed the change of grammar in somebody's writing from a period where they're not doing brilliantly, but they're slightly well fed through to a period where actually their rations are right down to the bare minimum. And, and, and the way the conceptualization of what is happening to me minute by minute and hour by hour, and what minutes and hours mean, those seem to change and shift in these extreme contexts. But I sort of think of a, of a much less extreme example. And one of the writings that I've been very inspired by is the well-known British housewife Nella Last, about whom a wonderful film was made a few years ago. Nella Last, for people who don't know about her, was one of the diarists commissioned by the Mass Observation Project. And she wrote, she absolutely threw herself into it. And I particularly love a moment in her diary where she's reflecting on her state of mind. So she was never in any mortal danger. She was anxious about her family, uh, she was anxious about friends. But Barrow in Furness um, suffered some bombing, but not much. But she reflects after a little bout of bombing in the docks in Barrow in Furness. She reflects, actually, since then, I found that I am changing my perspective on what I'm doing every day. And she says, basically, I'm finding that I'm concentrating on being rather than wanting to be. And, and she sort of unpacks that a little bit and says, basically, I used to rush around planning out the next fortnight of what was going to go on and what tins of food I needed to have in and what I was going to do to organize such and such from my sons. And actually, I find I'm not doing that anymore. I'm just 
taking each day as it comes. And she has a lovely expression, um, threading each day evenly on, on a line. And so even in that context, and we're not talking about the sort of physiological harm of living in famine or anything like that, we've got somebody reflecting after a nearby bombing event, uh, you know, down in the centre of the town in the docks, that has just forced her to to rethink where she is from day to day. So I think I think this is something that you see in wartime across the piece, um, from very extreme cases to, to much more mild cases. This is a sense of dislocation affecting everybody in, in, in similar ways. Yeah, so, I mean, those are two extraordinary examples that you just pulled out there. And, you know, this idea that we can actually visualise the impacts of war by looking at the syntax of people who are writing under its extreme conditions, as for those diaries that you mentioned written in hunger, but also that second example, less extreme, but our project is all about visualising war. But what, what we're seeing here is that war is really impacting on, you know, how people are, are simply visualising time, visualising themselves, visualising their place in, in life and in the world. And obviously that, that has huge, huge well-being implications, um, that inability to plan for or imagine the future, as well as that inability actually to connect with any meaningful past that, that seems to have been severed. And, and that really does tap into something which the Visualising More project is very interested in, when I was reading about your your work, um, this sentence really chimed with what a lot of our other podcast guests have talked about. You wrote, war's attack on individual consciousness and emotional well-being could reach far beyond the theatre directly affected by fighting. And, and this is something which many of our podcast guests have talked about very passionately. Our habits of visualising war often incline us to focus on the fighting itself, but the impacts of war spill out in so many ways into someone's sort of fairly day-to-day -day life in Barrow and Furnace, for example. And your project really is shining a light on one key existential aspect of that, because our ability to locate ourselves in time is so vital to our sense of identity and purpose. So I think your project, in order to look at this issue, your project is drawing on some psychological research as well as philosophy. What can psychology tell us about the profound impact of this temporal dislocation? I've been really inspired by the work of a scholar called Lisa Baretza, who's at Birkbeck, who's in the Department of Psychosocial Studies there. And Baretza's wonderful recent study, um, Enduring Time, made a lot of connections for me and, and, and the, indeed across to the broadcaster and well-known scholar, um, Claudia Hammond, who also has a psychology background. But Baretza has written very interestingly and often very movingly about uh, endurance and maintenance and many other things that, and this goes back to knitting perhaps as well, many other things that perhaps one associates more with feminist studies or with the experience of women. And that is, uh, I'm finding is enormously helpful for unlocking the, the, the sort of psychology of what's going on as we explore these different groups living outside of time. Because the need to endure in time or the need to maintain one's temporal connections when they are so fraught and so stretched is is a need that can only be met through particular kinds of work and those kinds of work are often the kinds of work that culturally and historically one would associate with the work of women and it's maintaining human interpersonal connections with families and I think, by the way, you know, families are massively important in this study of the present, um, much more so than I would have imagined when I started thinking about it. But, you know, family relationships and then the work of care that one does to maintain one's own relationship with oneself, as another sociologist has put it, you know, maintaining connections with one's own idea of oneself becomes a careful work that is demanding and difficult in these extreme circumstances. So I think psychology mapped across into social studies is revealing all kinds of ways in which, um, as a historian, I can think this through. And, and there's some amazing work going on in different disciplines right now that is incredibly illuminating on that. And it's clear that your project is very interdisciplinary. You know, you're drawing on literary studies, obviously you're drawing on history, social studies, psychology, and so on. And that gets me thinking a bit more about the sources that you're also going to be looking at. So, so thinking again about your research on ordinary people in World War II, you've mentioned diaries, you've mentioned correspondence, um, that wonderful postcard from your grandfather, for example. But what other kinds of sources are you going to be looking at to understand how World War II impacted people's experiences of the present and their sense of time as, as events continue to unfold? 
With a focus on the, the idea that people are trying to work through this temporal dislocation and the sources that we're looking at are part of that work, the business of understanding how a letter is actually written, you know, grammatically and syntactically is actually important because we're understanding that this is the work of writing this letter that this person is doing to try and recreate their place in time. And actually, of course, ultimately, it's a heroic story because these people succeed. Even the people who are going to die in a camp have succeeded in the work that they have done in creating a tissue of, of temporal meaning that is going to give them a sort of sense of what it is to be alive today and thinking through the next few hours into tomorrow morning. So correspondence is super important for some of the people in particular, and particularly the prisoners of war early on in their captivity when it took a long time for correspondence to be established. And the accounts of people in prisoner of war camps getting their first letters after about four or five months um, at the outside, it would have been about five months, are extraordinary. And extraordinary obsessions around correspondence emerge both my grandfather, and I think this is quite common with many prisoners of war, but certainly it was true of somebody I wrote about in my most recent book on France, uh, the former Prime Minister Leon Blum, who was um, incarcerated in Germany for a couple of years as a high status prisoner. All these people, when they write letters, become obsessed with chronicling the comings and goings of correspondence. So uh, if you've only got uh, like a side of A5 effectively to send home every week, that a third to half of it could be devoted to charting. Well, I had on the 23rd, I had, uh, you know, Auntie so-and-so's second letter, but her first letter only came through on the 27th, which was after I replied to her second letter asking about such. A, I mean, some of these people become slightly maniacal and Leon Blum, this French politician, writes to his son and says, I, I am becoming a bit maniacal with, with chronology. So. I guess these are quite obvious sources in some ways, but we're looking at them as work and creative acts in themselves, not just as bits of accounts that, that are testifying to a state of mind, but they are part of the development of somebody's working through their state of mind in themselves. I have a quite different sideline on this, which is connected with my you know, interest in music and performance, and, 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 and I'm not quite sure how this is going to work out in the project yet, but I am interested in in um, acts of performance and um, drama and music and liturgy as different people in different contexts engage with them and there is something I think quite interesting about the idea of sitting down for 45 minutes and listening to some pieces of music or going to a show which has a beginning and a middle and an end and then going back to the monotony of whatever it is you're doing in your camp or wherever you are for the rest of that time that's I think very very interesting and certainly the prisoners of war that I'm interested in, a lot of them got fascinated by Western art music, classical music, because some keen guys got hold of records through the Red Cross. And one person in particular um, set up gramophone recitals and he invited the chaps in just to listen to um, a sequence of gramophone records over about 45 minutes. And we have an amazing oral account of those concerts because the organised them, left his oral testimony at the Imperial War Museum. But what those little performances are doing across 45 minutes or an hour, a bit like going to a church service, what going to a church service does to people um, with its liturgical flow, giving them for a short while the sense of time that moves through a sequence of acts or responses to something that you're listening to, and it has a beginning and a middle and an end. That, I think, is an interesting sideline on the whole question, which I'd hope to be able to look into. Yeah, really, really fascinating. You know, we inherit these storytelling habits, don't we? This sort of, These narrative arcs where you have a beginning, a middle and an end, some kind of closure, some kind of sequence. And so you can understand why that is, you know, something that's familiar and comforting mm. almost. And I think that does compare really nicely with this idea that the exchange of letters became a story in itself because, you know, they crossed at the wrong times in the post and the correspondence, while trying to tell a story of what was going on when was hampered by all these accidents of time and these accidents of exchange. The question of your sources and, and your focus on people's diaries, people's letters, I think raises a really interesting question around control and agency, you know, who or what controls people's sense of time during a war and this attempt actually to, to take control by writing and by making, you know, very interested in what you were saying about these acts of creation that are a way of enduring time. Obviously, during World War II, the war itself disrupted the normal flow of life with 
men going away to fight, ordinary routines put on hold, children evacuated, and so on. Do we see evidence that governments or military leaders or, or the press tried to address or reduce the sense of disruption by predicting swift victories, by talking about the future after the war, or even just by giving people things to look forward to? You know, we've seen in the pandemic, you know, last year, the talk of a normal Christmas is something that people have to look forward to and these kind of coordinates that you can hang on to to sort of retain a sense of time. Do we see much evidence of this and evidence of people trying to address this morale, this well-being programme of this dislocation of time? It's a really interesting question and I haven't really thought about it that much at all. The, the top-down management of this state of being outside of time and what are people trying to do about it. I suppose one thing that did jump to mind was just how lugubrious it is when Churchill comes on to say, this isn't the beginning of the end, this is only the end of the beginning. And there, there is, I think, actually something a little bit lugubrious, and don't get too excited about this, everybody, about that Churchillian rhetorical style. As I say, I've not thought about it much at all. But, but the other reflection I have is that there are people in, in the world of the BBC who are putting out the message that actually what we have to do is, is live in the present because we simply don't know and that somehow that will be healthier for us so let's not get super excited about Christmas you know we have to live in the present and then I was struck by something I remember from C.S. Lewis who of course did these talks on the BBC and one of his very famous books which was put together in, in during the war is the spoof correspondence of two devils screw tape letters and there is an extremely important section in there about temporality where Lewis is making the point that a diabolic approach to living through time would be an approach which is building up false hopes for the future. And that grim though it is in 1941-42, it may be better for the Christian soul actually to be able to focus on the here and now dull, awful, and messy though it is, and that that, um, in Lewis's Christian theology, would be a healthier and saner way of living. That reminds me to jump uh, out of Christianity and into a different direction of the beginning of Hannah Arendt, um, Origins of Totalitarianism, where in the preface to the first edition of Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism, she says exactly the same thing. The, the grim present is what we have to live with, and that's all we have to live with. So there is, I think, perhaps something to be explored in public intellectuals and people in positions of influence and authority, what they are saying about how do we get through this? Do we get through this by building up hopes about what Christmas is going to bring? Or do we get through this by saying, well, here we are, it's April the 23rd, it's raining, and it's pretty miserable, and tomorrow it'll be April the 24th. So that would be a, something to look at quite separately, I think, is, is what public intellectuals are, are doing as they try to work through these things. I mean, one, one could read George Orwell's letters, doubtless, and look for the same theme, and I bet it would be revealing of interesting mm -hmm. points of connection. Yeah, I think looking at grand strategists as well. So, so one reason why I was prompted to ask that question is a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago, we had on the podcast Phil O'Brien talking about strategy and inherent in at least the publicity or the narrative of the strategy and inherent also in the just war tradition is always a visualization of an end and a positive end and a sense of progress. And, you know, he talks quite interestingly about the way in which actually sometimes strategy is deployed more than anything to keep public opinion on side. And, you know, public opinion will be with you if victory is in sight, but of course it starts to fade when it isn't. So actually getting you and, and Phil in dialogue, I think, could be very interesting mm -hmm. on that. You're obviously looking at the ways in which um, people try to get to grips with disruptions of time by writing about it, by constructing a more understandable sense of the present through words. Um, this is really interesting for the Visualising More project because it gets right into what we're interested in, which is the feedback loop between narrative and reality how the stories we tell shape how we think and feel and behave. And I know that you've been drawing on the work of Eugene Minkowski, um, whose 1933 study, Le Temps Vécu, describes the present as a particular act that reunites narration and action. Can you explain a little bit mm. what Minkowski meant by that? It's a really important and, and fascinating insight, again, from psychology. And Minkowski worked through the First World War and has that very much at the back of his mind. The book, I see it really, Le Temps Vécu, um, I see it really as a deep reflection on the pace of modern times and how one finds a more humane response to and reaction to the pace of modern times. And so this idea of reuniting narration with action, I think he's trying to get at 
a humane response to the pace of time in which you have time to tell what has happened. And so it's again, it's, it's the point that, that narration is an act of work or an act of care to go back to Baretsa and that the, the challenge of living in, in, in modern times in general, but then particularly so in wartime, is actually, do you have time to narrate? Now, there, there are these theories of modern times that it's all about the pace, the speed, the acceleration is, is very dehumanizing. And um, in, in one sense, I and indeed my colleague Allegra Frixel in, in, in our recently appeared volume, we wanted to challenge that by saying, well, modern times are not just about rushing and acceleration. And in fact, you can see all kinds of different temporal rhythms at work and people trying to promote alternative temporal rhythms all the time. So I think where Minkowski is very helpful here is, is he's saying, well, however one is experiencing modern existence, is there a way forward for us as individuals and as communities to have the time to tell what it is that we've been acting on and through? And an even more vivid example, also from mid-1930s France, uh, which I think brought this to life for me in some of my readings, was Simone Weil, the philosopher who went and worked in the Renault factory to see what it was like to work in a modern factory in the 1930s. And one of the things that she says very vividly and determinedly is that the difficulty of working on the factory shop floor is that the thing you have made is instantly taken away from you and you are made to make the next thing. And what you do not have is that little moment of contemplation and reflection and ownership. And so you don't own the thing that you've made, not purely from you know, sort of the Marxist point of view of you, you don't own the thing that you've made because the capitalist system owns it and it's just your labour. But your labour has no time to be aware of itself. And that's something that she describes as psychologically very damaging. So taking those insights and then looking at people in wartime who are not in the sphere of action, but in the sphere of inaction, and how we give them a chance to tell their story, I think is really interesting. And when, when I first was working on POWs, and in fact, I can probably even remember my grandfather saying this to me himself, I had a strong sense that I didn't want to work on the people who were doing all the escape plans. And those are the people who have had ample stories told about them, obviously. And it's a great narrative arc leading up to the high point of escape and success or escape and recapture and disaster. But actually, grandfather said he thought they were all a bit batty. And for a lot of British prisoners of war, probably did help them with making radio sets or whatever. But, but essentially, it, people had determined to live in inaction. And so I think going back to Minkowski and turning it around, there's an interesting question for us about how we relate and narrate accounts of inaction like Daniel Cortier not going around with a gun, but actually doing very dull, repetitive, administrative, secret work, passing messages to and fro from letterboxes in Lyon. How do you narrate that? Well, Daniel Cortier did narrate it. It's a 900-page narration, um, very late in life, and seems to be something incredibly important for him personally to be able to do. But that's always the question, is, is in modern life and then in wartime, uh, what, are the, what, what are the actions or inactions that are unnarrated and how can we as people interested in, in human existence uh, allow them to be narrated once more? I think I want to come back to that question about um, actions that are unnarrated in particular in a second but I am just as you were talking all sorts of things were firing off in my head with my mm. classical background about this mm. sense of time to narrate this ownership this processing and of course you know in the ancient Greek world for example oral storytelling, epic poem, repeating, re-narrating the story of the Trojan War as a way of processing war time after time after time, as a sort of a moment of ownership, a time to narrate and a, and a time collectively to read, to visualise, to understand. These plays, these poems, like many, many other texts, of course, have come through time and are now being used, for example, through the Trojan Women Project in the UK to give Syrian refugees a time to narrate a time to tell their story. There's also an awful lot of work in the US with veterans using old war stories, for example, not just ancient ones, of course. So I'm very interested in that need to pause and that need to form a story mm. about the experience that people have just been through so that, you know, you're away from the idea that you're on a kind of a mechanised conveyor belt, as in the factory, and have a, a moment to process and to own it. Just, just coming back to the things that we don't narrate as well, the inaction that we don't narrate, you've got me thinking a little bit about how authors control our perception of the passing of time in war stories that can give a very uneven shape to our habits of 
visualizing certain wars. So, you know, there's the common misconception that the Battle of the Somme only lasted for a day because of the focus of the storytelling around it, for example. And this sort of build up of drama, heightening certain events by spending a lot of narrative time on them relative to others, which perhaps took up, you know, much more real time. Is this something that you're looking into for World War II? How the narrative time spent on certain events shapes our habits of visualizing it, sometimes distorts our habits of visualizing it? Yeah, I think so. And partly, I mean, this is is now quite a well-established way of trying to grapple with the Second World War. Partly looking at the people we want to look at, the big dividing lines are much, much less important to the kind of bringing to life of the story of Nella Last or the story of Daniel Cordier or, or the story of people living under siege. The D-Day landings don't matter to these people, except insofar as eventually their own recycling and retelling of their story will collide with the retellings of the D-Day landings 10, 15, 20 years later as they merge their own personal reflections with those of the wider public account. But at the time, those kinds of things don't matter at all. And, And I think that if you take the Second World War as a world crisis in which, you know, racism and tyranny come together in dramatic and terrifying ways underpinned by police state, then the Second World War lasts well into the late 20th century. And we should be thinking about the apartheid state in in South Africa as the very late working out of aspects of what the Second World War is all about. It's not the same as the First World War, but but we should nonetheless see antecedents um, in the way that societies in Europe and societies around the world are starting to wake up to the fear of imperial aggression when it is blended with the tactics of the police state and the ideology of race. They're starting to wake up to this much, much earlier than 1939. And so I think by, by putting these individual stories at the heart of what we're trying to do, and this, by the way, is why we want to do one of the pieces of work we want to do is produce a new source book, which is going to give these, these accounts from centre stage. These are accounts that are not neatly circumscribed from the 3rd of September 1939 to April or May 1945 or August 1945. They are accounts which cut through and go on beyond that the suffering from the atomic bomb uh, is being reworked psychologically and rethought conceptually in you know grassroots ordinary social histories and accounts in Japan well after the um, explosive flash in August 1945. So although that flash is significant in itself, the whole point of it when you're looking at these stories of people living outside of time spreads dramatically uh, um, in, in time beyond 1945 itself. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're really touching on a recurring theme, actually, of our podcast series, which is the, sort of the fallacy of the idea that we can easily demarcate wartime from peacetime as if wars have a sort of really distinctive endpoint. As I said earlier, the Imperial War Museum, their new World War II galleries are really resisting that sense and narrating through several decades beyond. You know, even so, we reinforce this all the time by thinking about armistices or ceasefires or pivotal moments. These are constructs of time more than lived experience, as you say, most people's ordinary lived experience only sort of engages with those pivotal moments actually in the aftermath, in the storytelling that happens after. So as World War II drew to a close, do we actually see lots of people keen to invest in these temporal constructs or this distinction between wartime and peacetime? Or is there an awareness really that it is a very artificial divide? No, I think at the, at the level of the sort of sources that we're interested in, I think the artificiality of the divide is the key thing, as you say. I think that, I mean, Nella Last, let's go back to her, she, she's in some of the diary entries from the very end of 1945 and into 1946. She will reflect back over, well, the war the war has come to an end, and what state are we in now? And she often reflects on, on a lack of generosity or a lack of community, and that for her, that there were opportunities in the war to build her own community of voluntary workers, which she, she enjoyed and reveled in. Those opportunities were lost at the end of the war, but there's also a sense that war has just had profound ethical and psychological damage, and that there are things that have been lost through the war which remain lost in 1946-47. We haven't got them back again. They've still been lost. Uh, I think that that's quite a, a common reflection, and it's what leads to two phenomena. One is that for many people, the narration takes decades. So it's well known that for soldiers and prisoners and all sorts of people who'd seen service, you know, they don't do the narration until the grandchildren are coming along 30, 40 years later. And that was the same with Daniel Cordier, who didn't have children. His narrations come 
20, 30, 40 years later. They're partly inspired by arguments in the French media in the 1970s about particular aspects of who betrayed who in the French resistance and that kind of thing. They get him going. But once and once he's going, oh my God, he wrote millions of words on the resistance and on his own life within that. And once he gets going, he can't stop. But there's this period of 30 or 40 years of silence. So that's one interesting thing. The other aspect of it, I think, is the need to romanticize earlier periods of time. And we see the same phenomenon that's well known in history in the 19th century. Touching on the the sense of a world that's been lost. And once 1945 happens, it's not that that world has been suddenly regained or rebuilt. So 1946, 47, people have still lost all the things that the war has taken away from them uh, in terms of community, uh, loved ones, a sense of an, an ethical world order, which obviously is in, in the 20th century under threat anyway, from the First World War and from all the crises of the 20s and the 30s. But I think that but you do you see uh, a romanticization of a world that could be reinvented in a lot of the way um, British culture certainly tries to cling to church monarchy tradition in the 50s and 60s and still does so. I'm really glad you mentioned silences there, because that's obviously an important part of the storytelling that is or isn't done about war. And, and you're absolutely right that, you know, that, that sometimes there's this sort of long period before people actually start to tell the story of their lived experiences. And it's interesting to hear that Cordier in particular was triggered by people telling it wrong and the need to correct. People's experience of time. To, to get at that, you're going to have to look at sources that are really quite different to the normal run of the mill sources. And in so doing, the picture becomes very decentered very quickly. Accounts of soldiers who've been recruited in, in the British colonies and taken to another part of the world to fight, actually, we're going to be as interested in what they're saying about the being recruited and going somewhere else as we are in what they do when they get there, when they've got their gun in their hands. And so instantly, the points of comparison that we're going to be looking for come to life when you're looking for, you know, non-standard military history sources, I would say. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, that taps in very much to some of the things that have kept cropping up on our on our podcast, this sense that uh, um, traditional sources, traditional habits of visualising will often marginalise certain voices, and, and so dominant dominant views and dominant ways of storytelling prevail. Um, so it's really interesting to hear that your, your source book, by focusing on inaction, among other things, is really going to be addressing that. We've talked a lot about adults' experiences, but one strand of your project, I think, is going to look at the experiences of Japanese child evacuees. And this is a subject that I'm really passionate about. Within the Visualising War project, I'm actually developing a new strand of work, looking at how adult-centred our habits of visualising war are, but also how adult-driven children's habits of visualising war can be. You know, children are taught in school, they're read books that, that are written by adults and they watch films that are developed by adults and, and video games and so on. So I'm personally very interested in how children's habits of visualising war develop, how they experience it. How easy is it for us at this distance to understand how children experienced time and temporal dislocation in World War II? Oh, well, I have, to, I have to come back in five years and give you the answer to that question, Alice, when we've done the work. But we have got this strand and, and we've chosen to focus on Japan because the experience of the evacuation of hundreds of thousands of children in Japan seems to have been something that has been of inherently great interest to Japanese society since the end of the war. So there is plenty of material to work on. And children's writings and their letters home and their classwork are things that are not difficult to access for the student that we hope who will, will do this work. I think what will be new and interesting and important to do this work in the context of our bigger project as a whole is that Japanese society in the mid 20th century is undergoing extraordinarily rapid shifts in terms of how people conceive of what the purpose of family is and and of hierarchy and relationships within the family context those are all changing and our, i think our hope is that with a kind of concentrated focus in one bit of the project on this specific example that will shine light on what we assume might be western and slightly different experiences of what children are doing as they try to reconstruct their sense of their relationships with the families when they're removed from home and so on. One suspects that maybe these kinds of Western versus Japanese uh, definitions will break down quite quickly. But certainly Japanese source material, I think, will help all of us involved in the project reflect on how individuals are trying to rethink the way they relate to social hierarchy, the way they relate to family, the way they relate to 
nation. And as you say, it's certainly the case that, that one can see, you know, the influence of the adult view coming through some of children's writings. But, but scholars of, you know, people who have been working on this, including Aaron Moore at Edinburgh, you know, are very, very alive to, once you get past the surface message, what then happens later on in the letter, or what's happening beneath the, much further down beneath the surface of the narrative that the child is put, thinks they're putting across. And then there's the question of, well, how does a child's view of what it is the adult wants to hear change because it does change i think precisely through this period in the second world war but it will prioritize children's voice in a way that i think will be quite fresh for japanese cultural history where people have been fascinated by this theme but they've often looked at it as an aspect of the history of the state how were they organized you know what kind of tags did they wear when they when they left the station or whatever it was you know we're going to start with their voices instead and that's again a kind of characteristic of the project as a whole I think one of the things there that I'm really interested in is this idea that some of what children wrote was what adults wanted to hear as well. Staying with children, I think one ambition of your project is to develop some teaching materials so that future studies of World War II pay more attention to how people experienced it in the present and how it messed with their sense of time. Is that right? It'd be interesting just to know how you think World War II is typically taught in schools at the moment and what, if anything, you would like to see changing in that. It's been many decades now that social histories of modern Britain or modern Europe have wanted to put the home front, front and centre, of what's going on. What I think we want to do is to look at the ordinary work of ordinary people developing their own sense of identity, developing their relationships, and understand the Second World War almost as an extreme case of the challenges that modern experience throws up more generally. So I think that's possibly one of the sort of shifts that's going on in our work here is that we're not seeing the Second World War as exceptional. We're just seeing it as a time in which the challenges of modern experience are ratcheted up to an extraordinary degree because of exile, because of siege, famine, captivity, destruction and so on. But that ordinary human beings around the world try to negotiate their path through those issues actually gives us something broader to learn from and maybe even hope for in our study of how we work within the modern context in general. So rather than the Second World War being as something exceptional, dramatic, difficult, I think that the project ultimately is using it as a sort of an extreme test case for the multiple difficulties that, that humans have. And then to say, well, and the heroes needn't necessarily be the heroes that, that you expect they are. So they're not necessarily the escape artists in the POW camp. They're not necessarily, you know, the people working to ambulance workers in the Blitz. You know, they may be ambulance workers in a very boring part of the country who are just working through their own understanding and their own relationships. I mean, one, one of the bits of the project that I think is going to be really interesting is that we're going to have a section on British housewives in general. And these are British housewives who may have fascinating, almost philosophical things to say about what the war means to them. But they may also be British housewives who are simply fed up with the fact that the pattern of work for their husband has changed. And it's not working out for them. And they would quite like some different options on the table, maybe a different husband, because certainly, you know, their experience of what their day to day existence is like has changed. And they're trying to negotiate that and navigate that. So that's just a very straightforward story about modern women going through some quite interesting and important adjustments. Those adjustments are ratcheted up because of the war and accelerated and, and really sent into a spin. But I think that, you know, the war is then a window onto modern experience more generally. So there's a shift in perspective there. How is it taught in schools? Yeah, I mean, it's taught in schools as something exceptional in and of itself. And I suppose the ultimate challenge is, and, uh, is to say, well, you know, is it exceptional in and of itself? That's a really interesting approach, deconstructing it in all sorts of ways. And again, evening out our sense of time, putting World War II into this much bigger picture um, where it is sort of a symptom rather than necessarily something so seismic and, and self-contained um, as, as we're led to often when approach it um, from school upwards. So, Julian, your project is potentially very, very big. I and mean, I think another outreach activity that you have in mind is focused on modern veterans and military families exploring their experiences of being out of time through conflict and the adjustments that they have to make when they get back into civilian time. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that? At Northumbria University we have an extraordinary unit called the Northern Veterans Hub and this is a unit based in another faculty uh, but it involves 
military scholars and historians as well as it's run by a couple of war veterans themselves and uh, military veterans themselves but it, it, it really important work both in the region in the north of England but also nationally feeding into cabinet office understanding of the lives of military veterans and their families today in contemporary Britain so there's a lot of social studies of challenges that veterans communities experience and, and how those challenges vary in different parts of the country and, and the sort of social and cultural issues that surround you know the, the lives of contemporary veterans but one of the uh, people who we hope will be able to work with us on the project Francis Horton Francis will be leading a strand on living at sea because she's been working a lot in her current work on on the navy and she wants to interrogate living at sea as a sort of sense of temporal dislocation or relocation in some senses as well um, through a number of um, case studies just to go back to Francis Francis's first book was on uh, POW veterans and their memoirs. So Francis has considerable expertise on working on what veterans do when they tell their stories. So to go back to the Northern Veterans Hub, the Northern Veterans Hub have collected amazing data on, uh, take one very precise theme in particular, what happens and what people say about what happens when the news of a bereavement is brought to the spouse or the family at home. They've collected stories and data on this that go back to the Second World War. It so happens that we have um, effectively an archive there to work on. I think what we hope is that Francis in particular will be able to lead on working through the significance of that archive and connecting her own work on living outside of time in the Second World War at sea with the experiences of people in the modern navy they process all the different sort of strange things that you go through when you think through living on the ocean moving from one part of the world to another part of the world that you didn't know shipwreck if that happens you know and so on so francis will lead on that once the project is underway sounds very interesting there's a lot more we could talk about and obviously your project has so much potential but if I may, I just want to end with one last question, quite a big one. If you had to sum up what we've been talking about today, what would you say the study of people's experiences of time and its disruption through conflict can contribute to how we visualise war? I suppose for me, we've been talking about this expansion. And although we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are these explosive moments in war and people relate to them, you know, like whether it's the dropping of the bomb or it's D-Day or Nonetheless, I think what we've been talking about is a view of the Second World War, which has expanded far beyond 3945, far beyond the fighting front. And as it's done so, it's expanded into a sort of psychological world of anxiety, of not knowing how we get from today to tomorrow, and not knowing where the normal rhythms and the normal tools and the normal connections are that we can hold on to to help us get there. And those are relationships with family members, relationships with close loved ones, and the normal patterns of a working existence. So when those are shaken and thrown into conflict, what we're looking at is a much broader, wide sweep of human existence in which that sense of anxiety, that wartime discomfort and disquiet affects everybody around the world in different contexts, whether that's the wasteland, I'm not sure, but it's certainly a vision that's global and includes people in many, many, many different kind of contexts for whom the wartime temporality has left them struggling to reinscribe themselves in time. And that struggle goes on for decades after the war and goes around the world. There's a lot in that study that you're doing of World War II, of course, that's of huge relevance to how people experience 21st century conflict. Of course, people's habits of navigating themselves through time and the stories that we tell to do that are both universal and culturally specific. So we can't map forward exactly between 100 years ago and, and today. But of course, what your study is, is certainly going to be helping us imagine and understand and visualise those experiences of conflict now as much as how that temporal dislocation was felt in World War II. Julian, it's been really fascinating talking to you and hearing about this project, which is just getting underway. So there's lots to come out of it, I'm sure. And so much of what you said has resonated with many of the conversations we've had on the podcast, not just the ones recently with Imperial War Museums. I was really fascinated by the way that you mentioned the silence that lasts for decades before people end up starting to tell the story to their grandchildren. One of the things that's triggered the new World War II galleries in the Imperial War Museums is the fact that that generation of grandma and grandpa guides as they call it has really started to die out so we actually are now having to turn to other sources of authority and have other people explain these well-known huge wars to us 
So thank you. Thank you so much for giving us lots to think about. You've given me quite a lot to think about too, as we get through the early days of preparing for what we hope to achieve. So thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you also to you, our listeners, for joining us again. Please do tune in again next week when we'll be doing a gentle bit of temporal dislocation ourselves. My guests will be experts in futures thinking, and we will be talking about the impact of science fiction and the power of storytelling to help us visualise and shape future conflict. So please do join us for what promises to be another fascinating conversation, very much linked to the things we've been talking about today, while also looking forward rather than backwards in time. If you would like to support our project, please share and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or whatever platform you use so you don't miss an episode. And please do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps people find the show. If you would like to join the conversation further, you can follow us on social media. Just search for Visualising War or get in touch directly by emailing us at viswar at standandrews.ac.uk. Our theme music was composed by Jonathan Young. The show was mixed by Zafia Gertin. Thank you very much for listening.